Next on the Pray in Jesus Name show, Dr. Chaps will pray about these important issues. Today is part two of our special four-part series on the church history of the doctrine of Christian salvation, the theological study known as soteriology. Today we compare the views of Augustine versus Pelagius, the Council of Orange versus Thomas Aquinas, and Martin Luther versus the Council of Trent. Former Navy Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt took a stand to defend religious freedom by daring to pray publicly in Jesus' name. Now he helps you by reporting the news, discerning the spirits, and praying the scriptures. Would you pray with us? Here's Dr. Chaps. God bless you in Jesus' name. My name is Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt. Dr. Chaps, and you're watching Pray in Jesus' Name. On today's show, we're continuing part two of our special four-part commercial-free teaching series on the doctrine of soteriology throughout church history. Soteriology is just a fancy theological word from the Greek word soter or savior for the study of the doctrine of salvation, especially as it pertains to eternal salvation purchased for us by the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. In our previous part one, we answered the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We briefly compared the apostle Paul, who said salvation is by faith, not by works in Ephesians two. The apostle James, who said, uh, by works is a man saved and not by faith alone in James 2.24. If you missed that version, go back to our YouTube channel and watch it over again, or you can find us at PrayInJesusName.org. But today we're gonna move beyond that and we're gonna compare in the first few centuries of early church history, the views of St. Augustine versus Pelagius, the Council of Orange against Thomas Aquinas, and Martin Luther versus the Council of Trent. Are you ready? Here's a picture of St. Augustine and Pelagius who was not a saint, in fact, he was condemned as a heretic. And yet many of his non-heretical ideas are important and influence later thinkers in church history concerning free will. St. Augustine uh, in about the fourth century in North Africa came out of the Manichaean cult. Before he was a Christian, this cult believed that human flesh itself was evil. And therefore you could never overcome evil in this life until you died, until you get rid of your flesh. But he heard some school children singing a song, Tolo legit, take up and read. And he it was inspired by God to begin reading the Bible. And he became a Christian, especially reading the works of Paul. Here's, here's a quote, he said, Jesus applied himself as the cure, being both at once the physician and the medicine to help him overcome evil in his own life. He believed that there were four stages of human history. And this is his original theology of free will. He said, before the fall, Adam and Eve were free to sin or not sin. They had free will. But after the fall, humanity could only sin. They lost their free will by necessity without Christ. After Christ liberates us from sin, then when we become Christians, we're free again to choose sin or not sin. And then in heaven, after we die, we'll be free to not sin ever again. He prayed, and here's a prayer that is famous from Augustine. Give me grace to obey your commands God, and then command me to do whatever you will. He prayed for God to give him power to obey. And he relied on the divine grace of God to enable his obedience to the commands of God. Augustine believed that human will is not totally free, but it is bent and it's influenced by sin and by our own human flesh. Well, on the contrary, his one of his adversaries was Pelagius and Pelagius disagreed and tried to refute August, Augustine by saying that moral perfection is possible in this life. It is possible by our free will alone. Prevenient grace, or uh, in other words, the initiation of the Holy Spirit to help us be holy is not necessary because we're, uh, we have free will, we can be holy without. And in fact, man initiates his own holiness without assistance from the Holy Spirit. Well, that view was later condemned as heresy. We need the Holy Spirit. Children are innocent and able to obey moral commands, he believed. And also if God commands us to obey and we are unable to obey, but then God punishes us for our inability, then God would be tyrannical. You see the logic there? That we must be able to obey God because otherwise God could not command us and punish us. 
if we were unable to obey him, that would make God a tyrant. So therefore we must be able to obey. And therefore he advocated for something which later would be called Christian perfection without assistance from the Holy Spirit. And that is heresy. That was con properly condemned by the Council of Orange as we will see. But he believed in free will and human responsibility. That idea is not heresy. And that's not full Pelagianism. That idea that we have free will and human responsibility is now been restored as not heresy and that's called semi-Pelagianism. So those are some ideas initially between Augustine and Pelagius. And those became influential in later years. Let's move on now uh, after comparing those two views to the church history of the debate that was arisen between the Council of Orange against St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the scholastics. And these were you know, centuries apart, but um, they were both influenced and they both had to deal with some of the ideas that came up between Augustine and Pelagius. And here's what the Council of Orange ruled. This is in 529, long after Pelagius and Augustine had passed away. They codified Augustine's theology as truth. And this church council met and they said, Pelagius is a heretic. They com condemned full Pelagianism as heresy. That's the idea that you can be holy without the Holy Spirit. No, no, that's not right. That's heresy, they said. And they also temporarily condemned semi-Pelagianism. But that was only temporary because later we'll see in the Council of Trent reversed and said, no, semi-Pelagianism is okay. We do have free will, but the Council of Orange really threw everything out, the baby and the bathwater with Pelagius. They declared anathema, the Council of Orange, upon anyone who denied the fall of Adam and Eve hurts us today and corrupts our will through original sin. In other words, all human will is, is corrupted because of original sin. But they did not go so far as to state that grace is irresistible and that some men are uh, fated to hell as if it can't be avoided. Uh, they didn't go into the extremes uh, and they left that open for future discussion, which came up later uh, between John Calvin and some of his people. Is grace irresistible? Can you resist? the grace of the Holy Spirit. Well, at least they said that God's prevenient grace and, grace and the initiating work of the Holy Spirit is absolutely necessary for any man to repent and believe. In other words, we don't initiate our own salvation. The Holy Spirit initiates by prompting us with his grace to repent and believe. So that was some of the, the views of the Council of Orange. Now let's move on, you know, like six, 700 years later, here's this uh, scholar, right? The first, uh, perhaps the most famous of the scholastics is Thomas Aquinas. And he lived in the 1200s and he wrote the famous book Summa Theologica. And he actually corrected or disagreed with some of the ideas of the Council of Orange because he wrote and he emphasized human responsibility and free will. In fact, he agreed a little bit with, not with the heresies of Pelagius, but he restored semi-Pelagianism as, as an okay idea that human responsibility is good and that we are free to sin or not sin. He even agreed with Augustine with regards to that. But it appears he was not personally aware, he wasn't picking a fight with Orange, may have been unaware that he was sort of disagreeing with some of the ideas that have been settled by the Council of Orange. But Aquinas wrote that deliberate reason cannot be overcome if a man is determined to sin. In other words, we have the power to choose sin. And if we're gonna be deliberate about, about it, uh, that's you know the hardening of our heart in that way. Our own personal choices make us responsible. While God's grace is prevenient and necessary, it is also resistible. We can resist the Holy Spirit. And well, is there any Bible proof of that? Did Thomas Aquinas just make this up? No, actually he believed the Bible in Acts chapter seven. He, cited the time in the Bible in Acts 7 when Stephen said to the Pharisees, you always resist the Holy Spirit. So it must be possible for human will to resist the Holy Spirit and therefore he defended not just the semi-Pelagian idea but actually Augustine's idea of original sin. He defended also infant baptism as a means to sanctify children who are not innocent of original sin or cleansed from the Adamic nature until they are baptized and so he promoted the Catholic idea of infant baptism. And maybe you have studied that, maybe you've not. I'm not even gonna quote this scripture, but if you're curious about infant baptism, 
Go look up Acts 2.39. Does that scripture support the idea of infant baptism? Some say yes, some say no, I'll let you look into that. Anyway, Thomas Aquinas believed that the human will is weakened. It's not entirely extinguished, but we have, still have some will, but it, it is bent, so to speak, as, as Augustine believed, by the fall of humanity. And he did quote Augustine, and he agreed that faith merits salvation. Now we're gonna get into the ideas of merit when we talk about the differences between Luther and the Council of Trent, but this whole idea of that, how do we, do we earn salvation? Well, it's not a question of earning salvation necessarily, but faith, I think even Martin Luther would say that faith is required for salvation, but does it merit salvation in that way? Well, Aquinas agreed with Augustine that it does. It does. There is some idea of merit. And by the way, obedience, when you change your ways and begin to obey God's commands, that somehow merits the forgiveness of sin through the cross, through faith in Jesus Christ. He's not saying it's apart from the, the atoning blood that Jesus shed on the cross. But this whole idea of cooperating with the Holy Spirit is what merits salvation. He said two important words here. It merits salvation congruously as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit and condignly as far as is it a gift from God. So is salvation a free gift or it is something that happens when we cooperate with grace by our free will? He said both. It's condignly a gift of God and it's congruously our cooperation with the gift of grace that allows it to rule our hearts. Human responsibility and free will. I want you to get that because Thomas Aquinas restored that after the Council of Orange had taken that away. All right, are you with me so far? So we've already compared Augustine and Pelagius. Now we just compared the Council of Orange with Thomas Aquinas and now we're gonna get into the third segment of our show. We're moving along quickly here. But I wanna take a little extra time to help you understand the differences between Martin Luther and the Council of Trent. Now this is Christian soteriology on both sides. And we said in our first show that Martin Luther, as an Augustinian monk, not just followed Augustine, but he also followed the Apostle Paul. Faith is not by works. Now the Council of Trent, however, that was uh, the church council at the time. At the time there was no Protestant and Catholic yet. There was just this guy, Martin Luther, and he tacked the 95 theses on the door and then uh, he went into battle against the church, which what, there was only one church. The Council of Trent gave a response to some of Luther's ideas and that became Catholic soteriology. So now we're gonna compare church history. And I, by the way, I'm not picking and choosing sides. I'm not gonna say Protestant or Catholic, I'm just a historian, we're just explaining what happened. So Martin Luther, opposed Tetzel, who was one of the, I suppose, fundraisers of the church at that time, and, and this man was greedy, and this man was corrupt. And, and he was going around selling papal indulgences to forgive the dead. In other words, if the church has a treasury of merit, they can sell forgiveness of, to people who sin or get your loved ones out of purgatory. One of the favorite phrases, when a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Well, good grief, I mean, if anyone can't see, that's corrupt. Uh, so Luther went against it. He posted his 95 theses on the door of the church at Wittenberg, and he led the Protestant Reformation. This was history making in the process. Uh, well, of course, he was called on the carpet by some of the cardinals, like uh, Cardinal Eck and Cajetan in 1521. They called him to recant, and of course, he issued his famous I refuse to recant, he said, here I stand, I can do no other. Well, it's courageous, you know, it's, it's almost heroic. Of course, the Protestants believe he took a stand for the right thing. And yet, there were some theological differences where he might not have been on the right side. And I agree with some of things of both sides of this. I'm, again, I'm not taking sides, but here's where Luther came from in his soteriology. He was an Augustinian monk, followed Augustus, or uh, Augustine. And uh, he also struggled in his own life against his own personal sin. In fact, he'd go to confessional booths so many times that uh, the priest would throw him out and say, enough, enough. And finally, he was seeking forgiveness of sins and, and he was out in a storm. And there was a dramatic lightning strike. Maybe you've seen the movie recreation of this. 
and he was born again by faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, he had a powerful conversion experience and he believed after that time, enough of this trying to earn your salvation, we're saved by faith alone. We're not saved by works. And he finally understood what Paul was saying in Ephesians 2, where Paul says, you know, we're saved by grace through faith. And this not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Grace is a free gift of God. That was such an important theme and so personal to his uh, conversion. And yet he said some very controversial things. He said, simul justus et peccator. Well, that's Latin and it means at the same time justified and sinner. In other words, you can be a sinner and be forgiven at the same time you're enjoying your sins. Well, that might be overboard. That might go into the antinomian heresy a little bit. We'll, we'll talk about that later, but that idea that you can be saved without repentance of your sins, that offended the Catholics at Trent. And Martin Luther went, uh, continued to say, if you're saved by faith alone, that means you only have to believe in Christ. And repentance, although it's you know, a good idea not to sin, it's unessential to your salvation. And for this, he was accused of the antinomian heresy. In fact, is it true that you only have to believe the gospel and you don't have to repent? No, because the Bible says this in Mark chapter one, we gotta go back to the teachings of Jesus. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So repentance and belief in the gospel, they're both essential. And, but Martin Luther, uh, although he tried to return to the scriptures, he, he may have neglected that part of Jesus' essential teaching, repentance is mandatory. He said that scripture went to the sola scriptura, right? Scripture supersedes church tradition, that holiness is imputed to cover our sins. Imputed is an important word, we'll compare that in a few minutes. He translated the Bible into German, making it very popular. So now there was this great uprising in Germany and they, many rejected the Catholic Church, Sacraments are optional, there's no such thing as merit. In fact, he disagreed with Thomas Aquinas, said that uh, we don't merit salvation. There's no such thing as merit, he said. Denied human will is free to not sin. We must be sinners. In fact, he said this, be a sinner and sin boldly, but believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly. Well, that was over the top. That really offended some of the believers uh, in the Council of Trent. Uh, and this whole idea that there is no free will, again, I point back to Joshua 24, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. As for me and not my house, we will serve the Lord. So there is free will and Martin Luther was against that. So what did the Council of Trent do? Well, the, the church, I won't say the Catholic church yet because at this time there was only one church, but they organized a council and there, there was a balance to, uh, correct this wild boar who was running in the vineyard of the Lord as they describe Martin Luther, right? Uh, they use very colorful terms. You can picture the battle. Here's a picture of Martin Luther standing before the council saying, I, here I stand, I can do no other. He's not gonna repent of his beliefs, which may or may not be in agreement. But anyway, these people thought he was a heretic. So they tried to balance. Now the Council of Trent did some correction to what had been determined at the Council of Orange. The Council of Trent did not go full Pelagian, but they, they agreed with Aquinas and they restored semi-Pelagian ideas of free will and human responsibility. They dismissed Luther as antinomian. Antinomian means heresy, that's like without law, anti-nomos, without law. He's a lawless man, he doesn't believe we have to do anything to be saved. Well, that idea, the antinomianism is heresy, but whether or not Luther was that, uh, well, I'll leave it up to you to decide. They believed, and the Council of Trent made the following statements. They affirmed the Council of Orange that prevenient grace must be initiated by the work of the Holy Spirit and is absolutely necessary for salvation. So they agreed with Augustine, they disagreed with Pelagius, they affirmed the findings of Orange in that regard. They also said that human will is weakened, but it's not extinguished, it's not entirely thrown out like Luther was saying, and it, human will does play a role. So here they sort of distanced themselves from Orange a little bit and instead they supported Thomas Aquinas who had corrected that idea that there is human will, there is human responsibility. 
By the way, they continue to say, neither faith nor works precede grace, and grace alone merits us salvation. You don't earn your salvation, but the grace of God is what merits salvation for us. Also that baptism eradicates the sinful Adamic nature, even in children. They affirm the idea of infant baptism, as many Protestants later would renounce. You, you know, you can't baptize infants, you have to wait till they reach the age of consent, are born again, choose the gospel for themselves. Well, okay, but the Council of Trent said, baptism is useful, the sacraments are useful, including the sacrament of penance, which is useful to eradicate sin subsequent to salvation. After you're saved and you continue in some sin, should you go to the confessional booth? Yes, the Council of Trent thought that was helpful. They declared anathema on those who believe salvation is by faith alone. You remember in James 2.24, James said, by works is a man justified and not by faith alone. So Martin Luther, remember he wanted to throw out the book of James as an epistle of straw? No, the Council of Trent affirmed the book of James, affirmed the Bible, even though Luther didn't want that, uh, they said salvation is not by faith alone. Just believing you're forgiven doesn't make it true and also that grace is resistible and can be rejected by the human will. In this sense, they restored semi-Pelagianism as not heresy anymore. Now it's reasonable to believe that we can resist. In fact, they affirmed Aquinas, they affirmed Acts 7. Stephen said, you Pharisees always resist the Holy Spirit. Council of Trent agreed with the Bible on that. Man, however, can lose his salvation by backsliding into mortal sins. They also affirm the teaching of Luke 10, that loving God and your neighbor is necessary for salvation. You've got to love in order to be saved. Holiness, therefore, holiness is defined as love, and sanctification, the cleansing from sin, these are mandatory ideas, they're not optional at all. In fact, they went so far to say the sacraments are necessary and useful for salvation. Now, they may have gone a little overboard there. They declared Rome as the center, you've, you've gotta take the sacrament from the Pope, Okay, uh, I don't agree with that. But sacraments are useful, but are they necessary? Council of Trent said yes. And they reversed the canon of, of orange, right? Trent can, you can look this up on your own time. Trent canons four and five actually overrule the orange canons five and eight concerning free will and they restored semi-Pelagianism. They also ruled that Christ's righteousness is infused into our behavior through obedience, not imputed to merely cover sin. Imputed means it just covers over your sins, infused means it actually changes your behavior. Of course, they also affirm that the Roman Catholic Church is now elevating uh, tradition and papal authority to equal weight as scripture. And I disagree with that, I believe sola scriptura, uh, but it's something that they did. R.C. Sproul, who is a Protestant reform theologian today, uh, it, this is in his book, 1995, called Faith Alone. He condemned what they believed in the Council of Trent. He said, balancing on the heretical razor between the Council of Orange and Martin Luther, they cut themselves on that razor. I love that criticism of the Council of Trent. I don't agree with R.C. Sproul on everything, but I think he, listen, they had a tough job. They were trying to balance between Pelagius and the Council of Orange, Aquinas, Augustine, and here's this Martin Luther guy. How are we gonna sort all that out? I think they got some of it right. I think they got some of it wrong. I'm not sure. I'll let you be the judge. Again, Again, I'm not here to affirm or deny uh, which group is heresy. I think there is one church. People who follow Jesus Christ are part of one church. Now, whether you call yourself Protestant or Catholic, there's room for disagreement. Whether you follow the teachings of Luther or Trent, there's room for disagreement. Whether you follow the teachings of Paul in the Bible or James in the Bible, we're all in the same chorus. We're just singing different notes. And we all follow the one conductor who is Jesus Christ. So that is our lesson for today. Uh, on the next lesson, and we're gonna take a short commercial break here, uh, but when we come back in, in lesson three, I'll give you a preview right after this short commercial break. Can I take a moment to ask you to donate today? There are such important battles that we're fighting and winning around the country to defend religious liberty. 
how much is the right to pray in Jesus' name worth to you? Well, to me, it was worth a 16-year career and a million-dollar pension, which I sacrificed to defend Jesus Christ. I'm asking you to call us today, toll-free at 866-Obey-God, and make a donation. How much would you pay to defend religious liberty? Would you give $10 or $20 or $100? I bet there's some people who are watching who can even give $1,000 today just to help us stay on the air, to broadcast this into people's homes, to organize these petition drives, and especially, we spend thousands of dollars organizing rallies around the country and petitioning legislators. Please call us today at 866-Obey-God and give the best pledge that you can give to defend religious liberty and take a stand and for Jesus Christ. We can't do it without you. Please donate today. I want to thank you so much for participating. Again, parts one, two, three, and four of this series will be available on our YouTube channel. Visit PrayInJesusName.org. On the next episode, we're going to talk about the differences between Calvin and Arminius, Jacobus Arminius who influenced the Wesleyan movement. So Calvin versus Wesley. But in between there, there was the Synod of Dort and uh, people who wrote about Christian perfection like William Law. And of course, Count Zinzendorf had a great debate with John Wesley about whether holiness and sanctification are mandatory for our salvation. We're studying the theology of soteriology, the gift of Christian salvation, and maybe if you've gotten this far, if you're still awake and interested in this dry theology, right? Uh, maybe I could just invite you to pray with me. Would you take a moment and pray? Father in heaven, we do pray about what we learned today. Father, from all of the church fathers on both sides of this debate, whether they follow Paul or follow James, we just wanna follow Jesus. And Jesus, we don't always love you the way that we should. And so we do repent of any known sin. We invite you to rule our hearts. Jesus, take over our lives. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to believe God's truth in the Bible and not heresy that disagrees with the Bible. But Father, we want you to change our minds and we welcome you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you in the next episode. Chaplain Klingenschmidt is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy who earned his Ph.D. in theology from Regent University. As a former Navy chaplain, by taking a public stand for freedom of speech and religious expression, and by sacrificing his own 16-year career and million-dollar pension, he was vindicated by the U.S. Congress, who changed the law and restored freedom for military chaplains to pray in Jesus' name. Dr. Chaps not only defended the Constitution, but his petitions have helped change the law in 10 states, restoring freedom to pray in Jesus' name. Dr. Chaps needs your financial support to stay on the air. Would you please send your best donation today? Please visit PrayInJesusName.org to donate online. Or you can mail a check to Pray In Jesus Name Ministries, Post Office Box 77077, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80970. You can also call us toll free right now at 866-Obey-God. That's 866-O-B-E-Y-G-O-D. Please sign up for our free emails at PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org.